Hello everyone, and as always, welcome to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now today, we are going to continue on with our basic tutorial for Gary Grigsby's War in the East. This is episode number three, and in this episode, we will be talking about the unit counters. And I just clicked on one up here to the right. I can click on one in the map, but every one of these little counters, we are going to talk about them, what information they tell you on the counter itself, what they are, uh, what they're made up of, and all of the information you can get over here on the unit counter card. But before we do that, as some of you may know that watch my videos, if questions have come up or things I've just thought about since the last episode, um, I like to go back and just cover things that maybe, you know, there still is a question about or I don't feel like I covered uh, well enough. I like to just circle back, cover those very quickly, and then we'll move on to the, to the next topic. So last time you may remember that we were talking about move modes. And these four right here are the four main move modes for ground units, okay? These are the only four ways that you can really move ground units unless you move them by a plane, but we'll talk about that. But if they're marching or if they're motorized or if they're on the ground, they've got to move one of these four ways. 95% of the time, you're going to be in F1 or move. Um, most of the rest of the time, you're going to be in F2 or railroad movement, okay? But I kind of feel like maybe I glossed over the other two. And the main reason is, is you hardly ever use these. Um, the Eastern Front War was just not a war where, you know, the naval aspects came into play a lot. Now, you know, down near the Crimea, that may not 100% be true, but for the most part, this is a ground and air war. The naval aspect of it was very, very minimal, um, but that doesn't mean it's non-existent. And so F3, naval transport mode, all that means is, is that you are going from a friendly port. Let's go to Danzig here, okay? And when we bring up Danzig, we see the anchor here, meaning it is a port. And we control it, so it is a friendly port. So F3, naval transport mode, is from one of our friendly ports. And let's just say that we've taken Riga at some point. We could take take a unit, click on F3, we've got a unit in Danzig, they, they could then get a little ship on their counter, and we could sail them up here and drop them off at Riga, okay? So it's friendly base to friendly, friendly, I say base, friendly port to friendly port, and that is naval transport mode. Then you have something called amphibious transport mode. This may actually be used a little bit more because down here in the south, you may want to use it once Odessa is taken to move tro troops from a friendly port, which you have to start from a friendly port, to another hex, wherever that may be, as long as you have the number of strategic move points needed to get there. And so if we took Odessa, it now becomes a friendly port. We could bring our troops over here and land them down here in the Crimea. That might be something we want to do, because if you look to get down into the Crimea, you've got these two very, you know, you've got a little isthmus here where you have just hex to hex, just one wide to get through. Same over here, you're gonna come across one to one. Um, and you see these markings here, meaning you can't move this way, you can't move this way, or this way or this way. Uh, that's what these blue markings mean on the map. Uh, there is no movement between those hexes. So you're talking about very hard, you know, slog to get down here. I can tell you from experience, it is uh, if the Soviets mass troops here or here 
it is very difficult to get down into Crimea. So we may want to run amphibious operations. And so that's F4. Uh, you know, the naval movement comes up very uh, seldom. It's not a huge part of this game, but it is a part. And so I just wanted to circle back and talk to you about that for a minute. Now, while we're here, before we move on to the unit counters, I did just want to mention each of the other quote unquote movement or mode. These are actually mode buttons up here. You have air recon. Okay. Um, you have bomb units, individual units, bomb airfields, bomb cities, air transport, and uh, air transfer. Okay. So let's take the drawing off here and let's illustrate each one of these. Um, air recon is going to be kind of hard to show because you don't have, there's not uh, set points where you're going to, going to be doing that. You can run recon anywhere where it's lit up. So the range of your planes will not go further than this. The game just shows you this is as far out as you could run air recon. Um, any further than that is outside the range of your planes. And so that's really the only limitation. If we did want to run Air Recon, we could pick this hex, right click right now, and the game would select units to come out here in Air Recon. Now we'll get into that. We're going to do a whole episode on the Air War. So I don't want to get ahead of my, myself here, but that is how it works. You could do any hex. Now, Different from that is bomb unit mode. Bomb unit mode, it will pop up what units are eligible to be bombed in red. And so when you're in this mode, you you could bomb any of these units, and we could go all the way to the north. It's essentially all of, right now anyway, all of the Russian units at the front. Um, and so we'll go back up here to the north because I want to use that as my example this time around. Um, you know, these are all red, right? We could bomb these individual units with our bombers, our dive bombers. Uh, again, we'll get more into the air war later. The third one is bomb airfields. And again, it will pop up here red, uh, eligible places to bomb when you're going to be bombing airfields. That is traditionally the very first thing you do in this game as the German player. It's the first part of your Blitzkrieg, is to try to knock out as many Russian planes as you can on turn one. It's essentially a turkey shoot. Uh, most of the Russian planes do not get off of the, uh, you know, do not even take off. You destroy them on the ground. Um, as many as four or five thousand Russian planes <clears throat> is the number you'll be aiming for to destroy on the ground on turn one. So bomb airfield, uh, bomb city. Now, this gives me a chance to tell you all of these little dots out here are not just like nodes on the railroad or something. These are towns or cities, if you prefer. The, the true cities generally are named on the map, uh, but just because they're not named, these are also towns slash cities. Uh, just keep that in mind, because obviously there are defensive bonuses to that. Movement is maybe, or could be different. Uh, we'll get into all that when we talk about modifiers in combat. Uh, but the point is, is you can bomb a city, and obviously if a place has uh, production, and you may remember, I think in episode one, I brought up when I was talking about the victory conditions, I also brought up the production and the towns. For instance, Stellino has a lot of production down in the south around it. Um, and you could bomb that. You can bomb the production. Uh, but again, a uh, topic for another time to get that deep into it. Just want to show you the mode. Uh, air transport mode, this actually has a several different flavors to it. You can transport supply and fuel. Uh, you will definitely be wanting to airdrop your unit's supply and fuel. Panzers will get the fuel, obviously. Um, you can also transport non-motorized units. Um, if, you know, you can transfer them from one air base to another. 
Uh, you can also, if you have airborne units, and you do, I think there's one down in the south to start the game. Oh gosh, I hate when I do this and say, oh, I'm going to go, here's one, here it is. I knew there was an airborne unit down here somewhere. Well, see, I, I'm not in the proper mode. I need to be in move mode to actually look at it, this unit. Uh, but this is the air landing division. It's an airborne division. You can carry that by plane and drop it. Uh, you will have other uh, units where that is possible as the game goes on as well. Um, but again, this is air transport mode. It becomes very important once you get you know far out into the east of Russia, you will definitely need to use this as much as possible to drop supplies and fuel. Um, air transfer mode, this just means, and you see all of the air fields light up, this just means you can transfer planes from one airfield to another. Okay, uh, but again, we'll get much deeper into the air part of this when we do a whole episode on the air war. Finally, along here, we have F-11, which is show battles. Of course, we have no battles right now. Uh, so it's hard to show that, but uh, there is a combat screen that comes up for every battle. By clicking on this mode, and then, you know, then the game moves on, right? By clicking on this mode, you can go back and look at every single battle on the map. Uh, if you miss something or think you miss something, or if you just want to go back and relive the glory of, of one of your big battles, you can do this with F-11. This explosion will show up on the map where the battle occurred. Uh, then you just have next turn, or at least in your portion of this turn, it would then move on to the Soviets portion of, of the turn. Uh, again, shift and undo move. Undo move, you can... You know, it's just common sense. If you take this unit and, oh, let's put it, that's one thing I did want to mention. These, these modes control everything that happens on the map. And so if you get to a place, like I, I wanted to go click on uh, this unit here, and I went and it wouldn't do anything, that will happen to you. Even, it happens to me, as much as I played this game, it, it just did. Where you go to click on something, it doesn't work. Usually that's going to be because you're in the wrong mode, and you just need to look up here and say, oh, I'm in the uh, show battles mode. 95% of the time, you're going to want to be on F1 move mode. Okay? So, anyway. The point here is, for undo move, if you're back here and you move to here, and then you say, ah, shoot, I didn't mean to do that, or I did that by accident. I actually wanted it to go, you know, down here somewhere. Then you can undo the move. But if you take this unit and move it up here to the front, and, you know, of course, if you do anything with it, but even if you get in the Soviet zone of control or next to a Soviet unit, maybe is a better way to say it, you're not going to be able to undo your move then. You can't essentially beat the fog of war by saying, oh, hey, I went up here. Whoops, I didn't see that. I'm going back. Um, it just doesn't work that way. But you can do, it's a limited undo move, which I'm glad that they have. Okay, uh, and so that kind of covers all of the different modes. For now, we're worried about these four until we talk about the air war, um, but especially move mode for this time, because we will be going through all of these unit cards and talking about, you know, what what these counters mean. But before I do that, I think sometimes it's maybe easier if you can see the big picture a little bit to understand what I'm talking about when I get down into specific things. Um, so one thing I want to bring back up is the order of battle. Okay, now the order of battle shows the main army groups, the main headquarters um, for each of the countries. So OKH is German, obviously, but then you have a Italian, Finnish, Hungarian, Romanian, Slovakian. They've all got their own uh, high command, as does Antonescu. Here, he's got his own army. Um, Romanian, right. I, I had to think about that for a second. Antonescu was uh, the head of, of Romania at the time. So he's got his own, you know, army group. I don't, he didn't command it, of course, but this is his own army group. Anyway, um, 
if you look at this OKH, you can hit plus here, and plus will show you all of the units that the OKH commands directly. Okay? I, I, I want to tell you that, then I want you to forget about it. Because we are going to talk about support units and command at an, in its own episode. Uh, that's going to be one big episode. It's maybe the core of this game, support units and command. Um, but I just wanted to show you that. And the reason I wanted to show you that is because I want you to think a little bit about the big level order of battle. Okay? And so out here you have OKH, I say out here, on the Eastern Front, you have OKH, which is actually right here. OKH does have units it commands directly, but we're going to forget about them for the time being. It also commands, it is in direct command of Army Group North, so AGN, uh, Army Group Center, Is that a G? Okay, sure. Army Group Center, and finally, Army Group South. Okay, Army Group South. Don't worry, hang with me here. We're just going to look at Army Group North today. Army Group North is composed of three elements. It's composed of the 18th Army, the 18th Army Group, the 16th Army, and the 4th Panzer, okay? And the 4th Panzer group is on a level with the two armies. So in, in the north here, you've got in this purplish color, this is the 18th Army, okay? In this light pink here, that is the 16th Army or 16th Army group. And this kind of uh, more neon pink, I guess you would say, that is the 4th Panzer Group. And that is Army Group North. So Army Group North really is here. Then you have a few independents here that aren't part of one of these armies or the Panzer Group. And they respond and are commanded directly uh, by Army Group North. This is Army Group North. So this is OKH here, Army Group North here. These independents go directly to Army Group North. Uh, but again, we'll talk about that command when we get into the command section. Um, I don't want you to get too confused by all this. The whole point of what I was trying to get at there is when we get into these unit cards, I just want you to be able to uh, you know, visualize in your head the order of battle, because I think it's helpful, okay? So let's go to a unit card. Now, every one of these units, generally speaking, 99% of the time, is a division. You see over here, I have clicked on this one. It's always in purple when you've clicked on it. This is the 291st Infantry Division. Okay, and because we have shift Z, we've shift Z to give us the maximum amount of information on the map when we click on a unit. We also see its headquarters, it's attached to it in orange, and you see it's the other units in its group or in its core. Okay, because if we click on the headquarters, the, the headquarters is a core headquarters. 26th Corps. All right, so let's go back, try to stay on this one as much as possible. So the 291st Division is part of the 26th Corps. Again, you can go back, you can click here and see it, 26th Corps. And so every unit card in the game is going to tell you the name of the division and who its direct superior is. All right, and so this is a member of the 21st Corps. 
so are both of these infantry units. So again, you see now they're lit up in purple and they're, uh, the other member of their core is in yellow here so that we know that they're you know, connected um, or at least part of the same core. You see over here, they are set up exactly the same way. 217th Infantry Division, 61st Infantry Division, and then you see 26th Corps, 26th Corps, okay? And because of the way that this map works uh, with this highlighting, it's very easy to see who's the member of a Corps, right? It's these three infantry divisions, which makes sense. You know, it's two or three divisions generally makes up a Corps. This is their Corps headquarters, okay? Um, and then you see here, the core headquarters also has a headquarters. And this starts to get into chain of command. I don't want to go too far there. I just want to point out on the 26 core headquarters, it tells you who its headquarters is. Again, just like every other unit card, its direct superior will be right underneath it on the card. And its direct superior is the 18th Army. And sure enough, this is the 18th Army Headquarters that's here. And now you start to see why I wanted to show you that order of battle to start with. So who would the 18th Army's Headquarters be? Well, it's Army Group North. And here's Army Group North. You see Army Group North. Who's their Headquarters? OKH. And that's how every unit card is set up. You will see their direct command right below the name of the division, or if it's a headquarters of the next next highest headquarters up. It's always right below there. And I know that maybe sometimes it kind of confuses people because you see two different names here, but the top name is the actual name of the division. The one underneath it is who is in command. And then when you go to headquarters, okay, that's the 26th Corps headquarters who's in command of that, the 18th Army, and you just keep going back till you get all the way to OKH, right? Or you could do it the opposite way. Um, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's stick here. Um, so let's go back here to our infantry division. Now, one of the things that you, one of the rare ways that you can change this division structure just slightly is this button here. This is build up or break down units. OK, but it doesn't really it doesn't change the command structure at all. So let's we're selected on this 291st Infantry. Let's break it down. OK, and this is always how the game does it. It will break it into three equal sized units. These would technically be regiments or brigades if you were following the NATO system. However, the game doesn't even do that. It doesn't, it doesn't want to confuse you by calling these regiments. What it does is it says this is the 1 291st, the 2 291st, the 3 291st Infantry Division. It just broke it into three parts of the same division. It doesn't go on then and start to talk about, you know, this is such and such regiment or this is such and such brigade. It's just three parts of the same division, okay? And so on the map, you're always dealing with division-sized units, and every counter in the game is division-sized, even if that division has been split for the time being. Now you can always put those back together if they're in the same hex and certain other requirements are met, but generally if they're in the same hex, you can put them together, and now you see the 291st is back together. But again, on the map, it's not going to start calling these regiments or brigades. Now, regiments, brigades, and battalions are modeled in this game, but they're not something that you can move as a counter on the map. All right. And I, earlier I said we'll talk about support units in a later episode. Support units in this game are controlled at the headquarter level. So this headquarters can have a number of support units and you see here, attached support. They are battalions, companies, brigade. They can be 
you know, it, anything from a company up to a regiment down here as attached support. We'll get into how those get allocated out, but they're not something you can move on the map. If you're moving it on the map, it's division sized or a subunit of the same division, right? Um, you know, you do break these up from time to time. For instance, you can see down here, some of these units are already broken up. And so here you've got the three slash 87th infantry. You've got uh, the one 129. You know, so a lot of these, because the Germans were trying to cover a bigger front, and you can see it's the three little hashes on top, which is the regimental symbol. Um, but they are always really still part of their division. 3 one 29th, 2 one 29th, uh, 1 one 29th, there it is. So these kind of got mixed up a little bit in here, but these three units are still that division uh, and they still have the same headquarters, okay? Um, hopefully that didn't get too complicated believe me once you play the game for a little bit this is all going to come very natural to you because i think the command structure is set up very well and the fact that you're just moving division size counters you may think this looks cluttered it's really not i mean if you've played very sophisticated board games uh, with a ton of counters this really isn't that many because we're at the division level right um so, okay, let's keep talking about this 291st division. Again, that is its command unit. Now, what do we have here in parentheses, this one of five? Well, this is how many hexes it is away from its command unit and how many hexes is the maximum it can be to still be in command. And when I say in command, headquarters units provide support, they support, they provide supplies and they provide fuel. So they provide all of the logistic support for your units, your frontline units here, okay? They don't really fight on their own. They are just there to what I call provide command, but really it's logistical support. It's uh, getting the right support units to the, um, to the divisions and generally commanding them, okay? And so, it's always advantageous to have your units in command, as I call it. So to be in command for this division and every other division to its core headquarters, it needs to be within five hexes of it. So we see it is within one of the maximum of five. It, so it shows the command unit and tells you exactly how far and how far it could be. Now, I love this system for command. Command in many big board games or in other war games can get so confusing. How far away am I from my headquarters unit? That is not the case here. It tells you exactly. And you see these two units, they're exactly one of five, right? They're one hex away. Uh, if we did move this guy back, look at him. He's now zero of five. Let's make sure we click off of our headquarters unit and move our infantry division back there. Um, and so it will always tell you that right there. Now let's go to the headquarters unit because the headquarters, our core headquarters that we were you know, just talking about how far the divisions were from it, it also needs to be in command to get logistical support from the headquarters one up from it, right? And so its commanding headquarters unit is the 18th Army Headquarters, which is located right here. You can see by the orange, it works exactly the same way. We see this is the core headquarters. The 18th Army is its headquarters, and it is two out of a maximum 15 hexes away. And you count these out, one, two, sure enough, there it is. Um, and core headquarters can get out to 15 away from the army headquarters. So as we advance into the Soviet Union, what you'll see is our divisions, you know, will spread out and we'll have core headquarters, let's say here. So let's say we have a division here and one here and one here, and then we'll have our core headquarters here so that all three of them 
are within five hexes of their headquarters. Meanwhile, we'll slowly move the 18th Army headquarters up so that all of these core headquarters underneath it, and if we click on this, if we click on the 18th Army, you can see that's a core headquarters. Underneath here is a core headquarters. There's another one. Here's another one. And evidently, there's one under here. Actually, this is its uh, <laughs> this is its air base. We'll get into that, believe me. Um, oh, and it has another one back here. So, you know, while we're on this, we'll see this is the L core. It just happens to start behind the front back here. Uh, last, this is the one where I said it was, uh, you know, Polish SS, which is actually just means it's an SS unit formed in Poland, right? Not Polish. It was formed in Poland. Or at least it was uh, used to, uh, unfortunately, beat down the Polish. Um, so anyway, let's get back up here. 18th Army. So you'll see if we went back to this core headquarters, it's 11 of 15 away. It can be 15. It's 11 hexes away. So it's still in command, even though it looks like it's, you know, pretty good distance away. Now this continues to daisy chain like that. So let's look at the 18th Army. Its command headquarters is Army Group North. You'll see here, you can trace the orange line. It is eight hexes away from Army Group North, but armies can get up to 45 hexes away from the uh, from their group army. Um, so Army Group North's headquarters, they could get up to 45 hexes away and still be in command from its command unit, okay? And, and Army Group North works exactly the same way. Its command unit is OKH. It's three away. There's OKH. You see the orange line to OKH. You see all of the army. Uh, th these are the army headquarters that Army Group North commands or individual units because as you move up the chain, so take Army, take the 18th Army. 18th Army can command both core headquarters or it can command individual units, individual headquarters. It can command anything that's underneath it in the hierarchy. Now, generally, you're not going to want to do it that way. Uh, you don't want these headquarters, uh, you know, commanding individual units out there unless you need this extra command space. So let's say this group, you know, for some reason we wanted these guys to be operating individually out, you know, out here where the rest of army group or the 18th army is up here. You may, and you can do this in the game, but we'll talk about this when we get to command, you may have them be directly to the 18th Army. Now they are now. I'm just using this as an example. If they were not, you could assign them to the 18th Army because then they get this much bigger command, I'll call it radius, I guess, command um, area. So it's up to 45 hexes. So that's how that works. So every individual unit, you see their name, you see who their headquarters is, and you see how how far they are away from their headquarters, and how far they can stray. Now, we talked a little bit about the counter last time. This is the soft factor, okay? Right now, we've got it on supply. We could put it on fuel. We can put it on number of units attached. Those are those support units I was talking about. You can attach them directly to divisions if you want, or you can let your headquarters do it them you know, the AI do it. And again, that will be a big topic of discussion. Um, you don't have to have anything on this. Um, you can have morale, you can have experience, or we get back to supplies. Generally for um, land units, infantry units like this, I always have it on supplies. And for panzers, I have it on fuel. Those are kind of the two, you know, most important things for those two different kinds of units. So moving on, uh, we've got the movement, uh, I guess, corner here. We've talked about that. If I click on something that has not moved yet, it's got that 
black triangle in there, but it will be white as long as we have movement points left. All right. Uh, but this one we moved, remember we moved it back and we moved it up. So the black triangle is gone. We still have the white corner, meaning we still have movement points left. This is the division, you know, the NATO division is double X. That shows you it is a division. And again, when it, when we bust up a division, it gives us what is the regimental symbol, three hatches. Uh, but, you know, it's still called one of three, two of three, and three of three of a division. So I think the developers did that not to confuse things or make things any more complicated than they have to. Uh, if we had to start naming regiments out here and thinking about that, moving that on the board, it would have been a little more complicated. Uh, this, of course, means infantry. Now, if we look at our counters, we've only got a very limited number of different kinds of units. We have infantry. You see infantry here, you know, infantry there, uh, infantry here. You know, these are all infantry units. Then you see headquarters, and the three X's mean core. So you can kind of think of it, you know, two X's moves up to three hexes as its commander. Three hexes moves up to four hexes as its commander. I say hexes, X's. <laughs> I've got hexes on the brain. Um, you know, Army Group North, you get up here, it's got five. Uh, OKH also has five they didn't give it the sixth it's like a you know you can't go beyond a five-star general evidently um but yes you have headquarters that's a different another kind of unit uh, you'll see the hq here now it does have some different stats and we'll talk about that when we go into the headquarters and command um, but for right now let's go back to our infantry unit um, so you have inter infantry you have headquarters the next kind of unit that I see as I move down here are railroad units. And I brought this up in uh, episode one or two, talking about railroad, talking about, you know, Russian railroad was very different than German railroad. Well, it actually wasn't that different. I mean, it, you're talking about just a couple of inches, I believe, that the, that the rail was set apart from each other. And so German trains would not run on Russian rail tracks. And so you had to have these specialized German units go and quote unquote repair the rail. What they really had to do was go in there and rip it out and put in German rail. Because my understanding is, is that the Russian, what they call, um, well, the beds that they lay the, re the, the rails on, Railroad ties, if you've ever seen railroad ties. So the bed that they lay those on, the Germans used metal, the Russians used wood, and I guess the wood in the mud was terrible. Anyway, I, I digress. The point being is the Germans have got to go in and completely, quote unquote, repair the rail where you want your supplies to go. And so up here we have what's called FBD4. It is the main rail unit connected to Army Group North, and we are going to have to decide where this goes to repair rail, because the minute we take one step into the Soviet Union, our rail cars will no longer work, and we're going to have to start changing this rail line. Now, generally, I go this way up to Riga, and then from Riga, you can make a decision. You could loop it all the way up and around these two lakes, or you can go straight to Peskov and from Peskov up to Leningrad. And when you do that, you're bringing your supply by rail further north and you're keeping your troops in supply. Now, again, you know, I hate to say this too often, but we will be talking quite extensively about supply and how you supply by rail, how you supply by the vehicle pool. We'll get into all of that. Uh, but for now, it's enough to know this is a railroad unit and you see the shovel on it. There, here's another one, but this is the railroad unit for Army Group Center. So Army Group North gets one. Army Group Center has two. 
Uh, there's another one down here somewhere. I'm not going to go hunt for it. Uh, just take my word for it. It's down here for, somewhere. And then Army Group South also has... Oh, here's the second one for Army Group Center. Uh, and then Army Group South has one as well down here. Um, and they will all be rebuilding rail. That actually brings up another fairly important point that you should know early on. Something called the Baltic Rail Zone. While we're talking about this, the Baltic Rail Zone. So in this central part of uh, the Soviet Union, they had built up their rail uh, to more of the Central European standard. And so it costs less points to repair that than it does uh, in the south or in the north. OK, <laughs> I just we'll just leave it at that for now. Basically, it costs three points to do something uh, in the north. It costs uh, one point to do it in the Baltic Rail Zone. And so it's just something to keep in mind. It just costs less. Okay, so we have rail units. We have infantry units. We have headquarters units. Uh, the next one I see here is a motorized division. And that is, you know, the two dots with the X. So it looks like infantry. It is motorized because think of these as wheels, right? Um, this is a motorized unit. It's a division all on its own. Uh, everything on the map is a division, generally speaking. So you have these motorized units in the Panzer group. And you can see it is that neon kind of pink. This is our Panzer group. Uh, if we click here on these two units, you see the Panzer group, even though it is a Panzer group, uh, or Panzer Corps, it does have infantry. Now, generally, I will reassign this infantry who their commander is. Um, because they just move so much slower, they will get out of command with the rest of the motorized and the Panzer divisions. And this is a Panzer division with the circle, you know, the circle inside of a square, or I guess the oval inside of a square, those are your tanks, your panzers. And really, that's about it. I mean, there aren't that many. I showed you earlier the uh, airborne. So as we move south here, now this is Army Group Center. Uh, you've got your railroad unit. You've got headquarters. You've got infantry units. You see your panzers here. Uh, you've got motorized. OK, and everything I told you about command works the same up and down the front. Down in the south, same idea. You have two different armies here in the purple and in the deeper purple. And then you have the first panzer in orange. And again, you've got motorized. You've got your panzers. They've got headquarters. And so motorized units and panzer units, they're uh, command structure works exactly the same way. So once you understand that command structure, you've got it. You know, let's just trace it here. 16th Motorized Division, all right? It's part of the, what is this, 48th Panzer Corps? I, I guess if my Roman numeral reading is correct, that's the 48th Panzer Corps, all right? There's the 48th Panzer Corps. You can see it's drawing the orange line. It's within three of five hexes that it needs to be to be in command. So it is in command. If it was not, this would be in red. So let's go to that headquarters. This 48th Panzer Corps is part of the first Panzer Group. And you can trace that right back here. And, you know, the Panzer Groups are similar to armies. And so they, you know, if we look at this headquarters again, it's within two of 15. So it always goes 5, 15, 45, and then 90. When you're thinking about the command and how, how close they have to be to their command, at the very lowest level, the division has to be within 5 of the core. The core has to be within 15 uh, of the army. And the army has to be within 45 of the army group. The army group has to be within 90 of OKH. And, and that's standard throughout the game. And once you understand that, you'll understand how all of these command structures 
you know, are supposed to operate. So here we are, the 48th Panzer Corps, it's part of the 1st Panzer Group. Same thing as an army, a panzer group. We go back here. This is being led by von Kleist. Um, you know, we haven't talked about commanders yet, but we will. Uh, First Panzer Group is part of Army Group South. It's within eight of 45. And then you see there's Panzer Group South. And here you go, or a uh, Panzer Group, Army Group South. Sorry, that was confusing. I, I, sorry, I misspoke. Army Group South, and that's part of OKH. And you see it's 31 of 90 away from OKH. And you could trace this all the way back up here to the north that OKH, you know, is on the phone with Army Group South, so they don't have to be that close together. Um, and that, you know, as I said, that's universally how the command works throughout the game. Um, as we move on here, we've talked about this. We've got the combat value and the number of movement points left. So we've moved this. Generally, infantry divisions at the start of their turn will have 16 movement points, okay? And generally, um, headquarters will have 50 movement points. Um, I'm trying to think, the reason I was saying, um, I was thinking about motorized units. Yeah, motorized units have 50 and the panzer units have 50. And so obviously, you know, they can go quite a bit farther than an infantry division. And that only makes sense, right? So an inf well, this is a good example here. An infantry division, the, none of these units have moved. Infantry division has 16 movement points, panzers 50, right? And so they can go quite a bit farther, as you would hope they could, right? because they are motorized. Um, yeah, so I mean, those combat values. Oh, the question came up one time before. What uh, does it mean when we selected in the options that we wanted more realistic combat values? Um, I actually am going to point you to the manual for that. The manual does a decent job of explaining it, but essentially I can boil it down to this one sentence, which is it's more accurate. The combat value is more accurate. When we did the selection, I think it's combat value true or combat value enhanced or better. Well, you know what? Let's go look. I think it's in options. Or is it? In, no, it's in preferences. It says, oh gosh, I guess it's not here. I thought it was here. I thought when we started, well, you know what? I'm not going to spend any more time on that. Essentially, it just gives you a truer reading of the combat values, and the manual can tell you why. Um, you know, it, it, it takes into account certain things that the base value does not take into account. There, okay, that, that was better, I guess, for the explanation. Um, right below combat value and movement points, you see this kind of squiggly line in 100. This is just showing you what percentage of the movement points this unit has used. So remember, we've, we've used three because for this unit. We pop back to the headquarters, then we pop back to this X, and we use three of our 16. We've used 19% of it, we have 81% left. Uh, I guess that's somewhat useful. I don't really, I don't really know why that that's you know very useful or why they decided to do the the setup this way because you see how many movement points you have left. I guess this is just showing you from a maximum. You know, you've used now 19% of it. It gives you a little bit more information that way. Uh, this ready. Every unit, and again, we'll talk about this, but every unit can either be ready in refit, where it's maybe getting upgraded equipment or new equipment. It's essentially replacing, reinforcing, getting you know better stuff, or in reserve. Uh, a reserve essentially means it's resting, it's not doing anything unless a unit within so many hexes of it gets attacked and then it will come out of reserve if you think of a tactical reserve like you know we're going to keep this division back hold it see how the battle goes well the reserve in this game it's similar to that 
but there's certain rules about how many hexes away if one of its uh, compatriots gets attacked it will then jump into the battle and that's reserve but most of the time you're going to be in ready at least until you get closer to winter in winter time often you will take your panzers as the german player you will take your panzers move them to a city and put them on reserve uh, also if you have a division that just gets chewed up or you know by looking at the production which we'll get into that you have new stuff on the way that it needs um, upgrades or replacements you could also you know pull it back from the front lines and put it on refit but if it's in the thick of the battle or maybe in the thick of the battle you generally want to have it on ready you know reserve it would come out of reserve if it got attacked it's kind of almost like sleep mode sort of but that it will activate if certain conditions are met and so that's that button now every unit card has the same three um, items well i say every except for the headquarters units um, and that is supply and this is shown as a percentage of the amount of supply the unit currently needs and so it currently has 200 percent of its supply requirements now these units every turn are going to get supplied there there's going to be a whole logistics phase where units get resupplied of supplies fuel and ammunition but right now it just shows you a percentage of what they need to operate so right now obviously it's got two times 200 percent of the amount of supplies it needs to operate efficiently or at least at its most efficient level 138% in fuel and 133% in ammo right okay um, then down here you have the number of men the number of guns and guns can be anti-tank they could be AA you know any, anything above essentially a rifle uh, or maybe even a mortar is going to be considered a gun and then you have what are called uh, armored fighting vehicles AFVs uh, here so you know your panzer units are going to have 270 173 and fewer guns usually a division is going to have around 16,000 men regardless of the type that's you know on average it's going to have around 16,000 in the German army um, okay so with kind of the front of the card covered let's talk about the one other unit type I haven't talked about and that is air bases now the way the game models air warfare is it has a command structure very similar to the units out here so you'll see this air base has a command unit and it's the eighth Flieger Corps okay and when you see this think of it as a like a core headquarters it's still got the three X's in some ways it's no different than the two core here but let's go back to it for a second it's the Flieger Corps and this Flieger Corps if we look at it it has a superior and we'll get to that but underneath it it has these infinity signed units these are air bases and I know that a lot of people that play this game find this confusing because they say well wait a minute are these air squadrons are they uh, you know air forces no they're actually an air base and they're mobile it, it was very hard I think for the developers to model the air war on the Eastern Front because there's so much open land in in the Soviet Union that you know airfields and air bases could be set up very quickly you didn't have to have a massive airport somewhere you could find a nice open field have your engineers come in there for a couple of days and have a rolling you know air base and that's what these model 
And I always like to think of them that way. It's a group of engineers and people <laughs> that, you know, roll up here somewhere into, into the Soviet Union and they establish themselves, let's say, on this hex. And now that's your air base. And that's where the planes return to and go to. Every one of these air bases, if I right click, you'll see now instead of having men, guns, and AFVs, here, you have fighters, bombers, and recon. Those are the three basic plane types. Without going too deep again into the air war, it's fighters, bombers, recon planes. And if we do right click on this, you can see the air squadrons that are attached to this air base. So it's not as if there's just one squadron here or something, there are three of these types of planes. They're all fighters, as you can see here. Um, or if we clicked on them, you'd be able to see they're fighters, or these these are fighter bombers, actually. Um, but we'll get more into the back of the card next time and all of this information. But while we were talking about unit cards, I just wanted to show you how this works. So the command structure, as I said, works very much the same. Eighth Flieger Corps, okay? Let's go see who the commander of the 8th Flieger Corps is. Well, it's the Luftlot II. The Luftlot is like an army. I say it's like an army. I'm not saying in real life. I'm saying in this game, it's treated like the army headquarters. So you'll see it reports to Army Group Center. Army Group Center is its direct commander. The Luftlot here, and you see it, it's orange right there. And then you see the units it commands. It commands Flieger Corps. Flieger Corps are just like Corps Headquarters, all right? It's, except instead of commanding infantry units or um, tank divisions, you know, uh, panzer divisions or motorized divisions, it commands air bases. And so this is the seventh LW Air Base. I assume this is Luftwaffe, 7th Luftwaffe Air Base. It reports to the two, so this is the seventh, reports to the two Flieger Corps, okay? The two Flieger Corps reports to Luftlot two, who reports to Army Group Center. The command structure works identical. So the main thing to get your head around is just that these are mobile air bases and they have different kinds of planes, different squadrons that are located on this base, but you actually move the base just like you move a unit. So I'm clicked on this now. Um, there. Now the air base is here. No, it's not. Now the air base is there. And the planes move with it. You can also move them by rail, just like you, you, you move infantry, motorized, and panzer divisions these air bases move exactly the same way, okay? And they have the exact same information, supplies, fuel, ammunition, how far they've moved, how far they're away from their headquarters. They have to be in headquarters. <clears throat> the main difference is down here. It's, um, you know, fighters, bombers, recon. But really, it's no more complicated than that. And, it, and again, the command structure is exactly the same. So if you know the command structure of the game, you can figure this out. Um, the only thing that's different on a headquarters card than the unit cards, we'll see here, there are two differences. One is this shows you how many units it has under its command unit points i should say how many points of units it has under its command and how many it can command and so these things can get you know like overstacked these headquarters units can only command so many divisions all right and we'll talk about that when we talk about command you know, how support units work, what they're commanding, the logistics of it all. Um, but just know this for now, this shows you supplies and fuel. And the only difference is they don't need ammunition. You know, 
supposedly. This is an abstraction, right? They don't need ammunition, but you, it will show you this can command eight, up to eight unit points, and right now it's commanding six. Uh, a quick tip, every division is worth two command unit points, generally speaking. I, I think that's almost universal. 98% um, of the time, and it may be as high as 100, every division is worth two. And so this one, uh, this one core headquarters could command up to four divisions. Right now, it commands three. Let's look at the one that we had down here that we've been looking at most of this episode, the 26th core. 26th core could do up to four divisions, eight unit command points. Right now, it's commanding three, right? We could put another division underneath it. Let's say this division starts running north with these guys and gets out of command for its headquarters. We can buy this out with political points to change its command to this other headquarters. And this other headquarters could take it and it would say eight of eight here. The other, the second thing that is on the front of the card of the headquarters is the commander. Right now it's Woodrig. This is based on a scale of one to 10. So Woodrig is right in the middle. Although I can tell you for the Germans, this is quite poor uh, and you can replace these commanders. Now when we come back next time, so we're right at the hour mark. We've talked about the front of the card, all the different unit types, um, and really it's that's, you know, we've talked quite a bit about command here, maybe more than I expected to. Next time when we come back, we're going to talk about the back of the baseball card for each of these units, what all of this means. Um, yeah, and I, I think that once you have that, the front and the back of these unit cards, that you understand movement, which we've already done, you are starting to maybe understand the command structure. Then we can start talking about combat, maybe some tactics, some strategy, and get into uh, those items, talk more about production, commanders, and the air war. So more to cover, but we have covered quite a bit already. Um, so I'm having a blast. I love talking about this game. I actually think it's a little simpler than most people think. After this hour long about the unit cards, you may say that's not true. I hope you don't though. I hope this made a lot of sense to you. If you do have any questions, if you wanna discuss anything about the game, always feel free to leave a comment. Uh, I try to respond to all the comments that, that I can. Um, but for Strategy Gaming Dojo, I, I had a blast. I hope you learned something and I'll talk to you next time.